Thank you. So today I'm talking to you with my CEO hat on for a startup company that's coming out of uh, York University. Um, very simply, this is a platform that provides privacy protected access to data. Um, this technology is actually coming from uh, York University. Um, so this technology is coming from York University. The PI behind this technology is a gentleman by the name of Dr. Marin Latoyu. He's a former IBMer, worked in IBM's big data cloud computing unit for about uh, 10 years. Uh, decided around 2005 he didn't want to work in IBM anymore, so he went to York University to build out his own innovation lab around big data and cloud computing. One of the uh, talented individuals that came along with him is Dr. Mark Stern. Um, if Marin is the big data cloud computing guy, Mark is essentially the computer hacker. Excellent knowledge in computer security, data privacy. Um, with these two people as the founders of this technology, um, it's essentially the, the genesis of this technology called Bitnovi. Before I get into what the technology is, let me just talk about the problem statement at a very high level. You have organizations, and this could be any type of organization that are sitting on troves of data. This data could be structured data, it could be unstructured data, it could be data that is sitting in one repository, or it could be sitting across multiple repositories. How does this data provider share access to data with people inside of their organization, but also people outside of their organization in a matter that's secure and private? When you unravel the layers of the onion, uh, you have individuals that are in charge of managing the data on the data provider side. Their day-to-day -day jobs are to ensure that data is coming in and being stored properly, it's being accessed properly, and that there are no data breaches. That last one is obviously what keeps them up at night. But now you have people coming to them and saying, you know what, we want to be able to access some of this data. Can you provide us the data that you're you know, managing? So this individual has to stop their day-to-day -day activities, and they have to identify, is this person that's asking for access to data part of the group, part of the internal group? Or are they someone from the outside world? Regardless of the, the type of individual, whether internal or external, they have to identify whether or not they have to massage, clean, and package the data into a safe play zone, like a sandbox, or if they can actually be given access to the data directly. This takes up time from this data steward or this data manager's day-to-day -day activities. And when they're doing these requests to provision data, they also have to adhere to the data security and data privacy policies that the organization has put on place from day one. That's one side of the coin. The other side of the coin are the people that actually need to use the data. These are the data scientists, the business analysts. They start off with a fundamental problem statement that can only be answered with access to data. And obviously in this day and age, we're in the world of big data. So what ends up happening is these individuals send in a request, could be informal or formal, to the data provider saying, you know what, we need to tap into some of your data. Well, right off the bat, a lot of times these end users don't have the right credentials to even touch the data. So step one is putting in a request. Well, as some of you probably are well aware, when you put in that request to get data, you don't get it instantaneously. It takes a couple of hours, a couple of days. I've seen an interaction at Sunnybrook Research Hospital where it took six months for a researcher to access data. Can you imagine how long or what that does to a research program, for example? And then finally, when these individuals do get access to the data, we're talking about massive data sets to deal with, big data sets. So it's hard enough to look at one Excel sheet that's thousands of lines long. Imagine now looking at an Excel sheet, uh, a SQL database, or another third type of database all at the same time in order to answer the fundamental problem statement. Uh, just to give you an idea, and this may not be applicable to your uh, specific organizations, but a lot of the companies that I talk to, um, what I do is I tell them, you know what, let's just say you're running three different data repositories, and you have three different data providers, uh, or I should call it data, data managers, that are administering access to those data repositories. Well, now all of a sudden what you have are individuals that want to access the data. And as this interaction grows, you start to see some of the problems that I was addressing in the previous slide. And then what ends up happening is the data provider will, in some cases, just send out copies of data that could be anonymized, uh, cleaned out, whatever it is, to those end users because they now have to work 
on the data analysis in order to solve the big data problem that they're trying to tackle. Now the question that I have for all of you is, when those individual end users are done with their data analysis, do they keep the data on their machine? Do they delete it? Or do they share it with somebody else? This is a problem that exists today, regardless of what type of market segment you're in. Healthcare, retail, financial, telecom. This is a problem statement that I've validated in many different interactions. So Bitnobi is essentially a piece of software that resides on the data provider's premise. Step one is the data provider, through the data steward or the data manager, builds what's called a user attribute policy that defines the end user. So if Michael is the end user, I define Michael as um, part of Dr. Wilson's lab in which institution? Sick Kids. Sick Kids, and you're a data scientist. So without actually naming Michael by name, I've just rattled off three attributes that the data provider would encapsulate in a policy. Then the next step is for the data provider to identify all the different data sources that Michael should have access to. So maybe Michael should have access to Sick Kids uh, genetics database and imaging database, but not anything else. And maybe we have to even localize that further to individuals in Toronto only. So what the data provider now does is he builds a workflow. He or she builds a workflow based on that level of data that Michael needs. When that task is done, you take the user attribute policy, you attach it to the workflow, and then the data provider's work is now done. Bitnobi enforces that 24 hours a day, seven days a week, depending on the need of what Michael needs to do. Now Michael logs on to the Bitnobi portal, and he has a fundamental big data problem that needs to be answered. With the access of data that I've given to him, Bitnobi virtualizes a preview of the data that has been enforced through the data provider's interaction. And now Michael only sees a preview of the data. So he gets to see the data schema, and he gets to see a couple of records. And, and that enables him now to say, OK, I can now begin prototyping my data job. When he is done prototyping his data job and he clicks run, that data job gets encrypted and it gets sent up to the data provider's premise. It gets run on the data provider's premise and aggregate data goes back to Michael so that Michael can do further data analysis, data visualization, data prediction, whatever is needed. Um, at the end of this presentation, I'll show you what the user interface looks like just to give you an idea. Everything that's going on underneath this platform is the data security and data privacy aspect of the technology that Mark and Marin have built. So the simplest way for me to describe Bitnobi is Bitnobi allows a data provider to build a lock. This lock has the data security and data privacy mechanisms embedded with inside of it. And it's up to someone like Michael to build a key using the data workflow builder that fits into the lock. If the lock and key fit, his data job is run on the data provider's infrastructure, aggregate data goes back to him. Regardless of the type of infrastructure that the data provider is running, Binobi is a piece of software that sits on top of it and it interacts with existing big data and data systems. We do not displace and we have no intention of displacing the existing data systems that are, exist, whether it's in a hospital, in a bank, or in a telecommunications environment. So let's go back to the scenario now. Now with an instance of Bitnobi installed in and around the firewall or inside of the data provider's organization, the way the interaction works now is the analyst comes along and now that data provider over on, on this side builds a user attribute policy that defines the attributes of that analyst. Then, here's, then the data provider will build a workflow that defines a specific level of need of data that the analyst needs. The data provider now attaches the attribute policy and the workflow together, and now the analyst logs into the Bitnobi portal and becomes prototyping their data job. They can build as many data jobs as they want based on a level of, uh, I should say, based on a preview of data that they get to see from the data provider. That data job, when they're done and they click run, gets sent up to the data provider's premise. If it meets the data security and data uh, privacy requirements of the data provider, then that data job is run and then aggregate data goes back to the analyst. And that aggregate data can be used in whatever fashion the analyst needs, whether it's data visualization, data prediction, further data analysis. In the event that an end user's data job does not meet the security requirements, there is essentially an error message that's passed back to the end user saying, you know what, there's a problem with your level of access or the type of data job that you created. You see how this interaction now starts to scale within an organization. 
So the reason why Mark and Marin built this platform, reason number one, they wanted to be able to provide privacy protected access to data. Reason number two, they wanted to allow an end, uh, the data provider to full, have a full audit of what is going on in terms of the data provider and who's interacting with uh, the data systems. One of the features that you'll see in the demo video is the end user has the ability of making function calls to existing programs that exist within the confines of the end user's uh, firewall. So if they're running SAS, SPSS, if they're running R scripts, Python scripts, they actually have the ability of making those calls in the, contents of, uh, in the context of building out their data workflows. Another feature that we've added onto this platform is when the end user secures the aggregate data that they need, we've actually built in an interactive reporting feature that allows them to build visual reports uh, in order to do you know, pie charts, bar charts, or whatever it may be to actually visualize the aggregate data that's been accessed. And then finally, the main reason why Marin and Mark embarked on this, uh, this, this venture or this technology is to increase the interactivity or the efficiency between the data provider and the end user. So in summary, this is solving a big data problem that I've validated within the healthcare, financial, and telecom markets. It's a relatively easy to use tool as I'll show you in the uh, demo video. And we have a strong team to bring, uh, to bring this to market. And unfortunately, I didn't show you the, the team slide, but given the time, I wanted to jump in and show you um, the actual demo video. So this platform was built out of um, the York University lab within Marin's group. And to give you an idea, this will give you an idea of what the user interface looks like. So what you'll see is a data provider will log in as the first user, and they'll identify um, a data source that they want to share. Now, on, sorry about this. On the left-hand side, you see a, tan, uh, a toolkit. The toolkit includes all the possible data sources that a data provider can share access to. So they can drag and drop uh, a data source that already exists within the BitNovi system. Uh, they can import a data source that's already within their area, or they can even real-time stream data. One of the key things is BitNovi doesn't actually ingest any data from the data provider. We basically provide a virtualized view of it. So now what the data provider does is they actually drag and drop the data source that they want to share access to, and there'll always be a preview of the data on the bottom for the data provider to see what type of data they're actually about to share. And if they're comfortable with the view of data that they want to share, they attach that result set object to the end of it. So what they're saying is, we're happy to share this type of view with the end user, and the end users, in this case, appear on the right-hand side, and as you can see previously before this video was made, three user attribute policies were already created. So now what this data provider is saying is, I want to share this view of data with these three individuals who have this type of user attribute policy defined. Once this is done, the data provider's work is done, they click apply, and now BitNovi enforces it. Now the analyst logs in, or the end user, the data scientist, the researcher, logs in, and they identify the data sources that they've been given access to. And what you'll see here is a number of tools on the right-hand side that are typical in big data operations. Select, join, group, alter. You have the ability of using all these different objects. Going back to the point of leveraging big data applications, Merritt and Mark have introduced this concept called the custom query object. This actually launches a script editor in the context of this data workflow. And now, if an experienced data researcher or data scientist wants to be able to program code directly in order to get to, this, to the segment of data that they need faster, they can do it. Right now, it's JavaScript. Down the road, it's going to include R and Python. So as they add more objects from left to right, you see that the data is actually, the view of the data is being transformed virtually. But we're not affecting the data source at the data provider's premise. When the data scientist or the researcher has done the work that they need to do, they attach a result set object, they can actually share this workflow with somebody else in their group. But once they're done, they'll click run. This data job now gets encrypted. It gets sent up to the data provider's premise. And then what comes back is to the end user is aggregate data. 
And now what can the end user do with this aggregate data? For example, they can now build out a visualization report. Might not be so important for um, end users in the life science world, but in terms of some of the customers we're talking to, this becomes a really important feature. So with that, I just wanted to give you a feel for what the user interface looks like. Um, and I'll open this up to any questions you guys might have. So I think we have time for maybe one or two quick questions. I was just wondering if there might be down the road the possibility of, say, you have two different hospitals with signal installed running. Right. And you're an analyst and you want to access data. You have access to data from both these institutions. Is there a plan to be able to work this data seamlessly? Absolutely. That's, that's the holy grail for the number. It's not, a just, it's not just about sharing data within the confines of uh, one organization. It's about streamlining the ability for an end user to access data from two different areas. And so imagine the, the capabilities that you would have if you could access genetics data from SickKids and from Sunnybrook. And then you, you, you grow that. The, the business strategy for this company is to work with organizations on an individual basis, but at a later time, there'll be a critical mass of many different data types of data sources. So imagine not only having genetics data, but imagine if you had access to insurance data and overlaying the two of them together based on privacy protected data that you would have. So that is part of the plan. Because it's a startup, we have to take baby steps first. Excellent question. Yeah. 